everybody. Uh, really excited to have everybody here in the session with us today. Hopefully we have a pretty good agenda plan, you know, talking about different questions that venture capitalists think about. Uh, but, you know, to start off, I really wanted to start off um, with an introduction uh, to our panelists today. Um, so, so Camila Norilus is a principal at Grand Ventures, and she has more than 10 years of consulting corporate and venture capital experience. So prior to joining Grand Ventures, she has held numerous management uh, positions at General Electric uh, across different business functions, such as GE Ventures. She's also a founder and have led several startup operation roles in her career. Um, you know, moving to Cindy Thomas, who is the senior associate at Precursor Ventures. Uh, her career started in the public sector, followed by years of experience across different startups in marketing and technology. And she really is one of the leading advocates for dismantling inequity in the VC and technology industries. And finally, I wanted to introduce uh, Ben Bernstein, who's my colleague and the principal at Invest Detroit Ventures. Uh, prior to joining uh, Invest Detroit Ventures, his career spans across uh, being an investment banker on Wall Street, uh, building two different startups, and also spending several years as an investor for a New York City-based fund specifically focused on job creation. So uh, thank you, uh, all three of you, for joining us today. Um, and thank all the participants as well. And as Piper mentioned, you know, if you have any questions throughout the session, please um, send a question into the Q&A. I will probably ask those questions, you know, within the session itself, but we will also have a dedicated Q&A um, at the end. So I'm um, really excited to have everybody here. Um, to, so to start off then, you know, I wanted to start off the day just asking a really broad question having to do with, you know, today's environment with the coronavirus and wanted to address this to Camila. And, you know, from your perspective, you know, how has the venture capital industry really changed with the impact from the coronavirus? Yeah. It's been interesting. Uh, I think we can all agree that technology has accelerated 10 to 15 years in about three months. Um, this is from a broader perspective, not so venture capital related, but we've seen, you know, telemedicine raising barriers, raising walls that existed for so long so that things would work in a COVID environment. We've seen people that haven't been open for, you know, the working from home situation to completely change their mind and their perspective about it. So even though things are not necessarily related to the venture capital industry directly, this changed the way we think, um, the way we operate as well, because this is what we do. We invest in, in innovation. We invest in the next wave of technology and having this change and this accelerated technology growth and acceptance makes things better for us. So this is very, actually, it's very exciting to see this from a, from a venture capital perspective. More narrowly, if we think about venture capital, I think the biggest shift that happened right away was the, the changing focus for a lot of VCs. When COVID started, when we, you know, the different states started sh announcing the shutdowns and we thought, okay, the economy is going to stop. A lot of the focus from VCs became mainly their portfolio companies. So we started to spend a lot of time with our CEOs to really understand how this could impact them, even though it's still uncertain. But how do we prepare for this? How do we make sense of this? How can we review our 2020 um, forecast or build cash contingency plans? Or even more, how do we take advantage? For a lot of companies out there, this is a huge opportunity. They're gonna lose competitors. So is it time to double down? So all of these discussions happening in the board level was the main focus for VCs in the first few months of the shutdown because we really need to make sure that our portfolio companies, which are investments that we have already made, are protected. 
Um, so th I think that's the, the, the biggest change in, and it drives a lot of changes internally too. A lot of VCs start thinking about their reserves, right? Because now that we have assessed all of our portfolio companies, where is our cash situation if any of these companies need cash this year? Because we will see a lot of existing investors stepping up, stepping up and taking that position of leading rounds or writing checks that are bigger than they would typically do in a follow-on so that they're protecting um, the companies. But I, one thing that hasn't changed and it's what's exciting is that there's tons of capital in the VC industry today. Um, if we look historically in the past decade, venture capital funds have raised tons of money. 2018 was a record year, and then we thought we wouldn't beat that number in 2019, and we beat that number. So there's a lot of fresh capital in venture capital, and now that, I think that now that a lot of the VC has spent that, that initial time with their portfolio companies, and things are somewhat normalized, or at least at a regular touch point schedule of them, and things were um, adjusted, they will get back to business where they have a lot of capital to be deployed, a lot of dry powder, and they need to deploy that in investments. Yeah. Well, and uh, Sydney, I know Precursor, you know, raised a, a new fund actually recently, and it just coincided with the coronavirus. Really. How has that affected, you know, your daily operations and the way you think about investing? That's a great question. Yes, so we are on fund three. Um, Precursor is a pre-seed fund, so we do early stage investing into companies. So for us, we call them like pre-everything companies, other types of companies we get excited about. And um, fund one was launched in 2014, 15, 20, fund two, and then fund three. So I've actually been along for the ride for all three funds. And I think it actually feels quite similar, frankly, fund three compared to fund two and fund one. I think that, you know, our thesis hasn't changed. And if anything, what has been really interesting is that right now, because um, I think founders who are starting companies are actually inoculated a little bit from the massive kind of like shocks to the economy that are going on right now because they are building. So they actually don't need customers yet. They don't need revenue. They just need a product. And when we invest, we're helping them build that product. And so for them, they're like, we'll launch in 12 to 18 months. And we're like, great. By then, <laughs> we, hopefully we will have figured some stuff out and people will actually want to buy your stuff. And so uh, we're still looking at companies pretty actively, but to Camilla's point around telemedicine and some of the like really interesting, I think, um, trends going on here, we're just as excited about them, I think, as anyone, where I think the opportunity to really um, democratize access to different products and services, which is my, my thesis, has just blown up. It's like if you have internet access to internet and we need to democratize that too. I know there's a lot of people who still don't have access to internet. We are, you're able to access a whole bunch of other things. Like you can, you can get a doctor's appointment from home. You can get a um, therapist appointment at home. You can like, I talked to somebody a few weeks ago who has this app where you, you take a picture of your feet and they tell you what size you are, which for little kids, it actually is pretty useful because like you change sizes when you're like, you know, one or two, like all the time. I remember those days going into the retailer and having to get my foot sized, and it was so obnoxious. And so it's just like all of these different things I think that are happening right now because um, we're all forced to be at home that allows us to be, um, you know, kind of really creative. And so I actually think it's pretty fun. And as an introvert, I've actually quite liked staying at home. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I um, want to shift over to, to Ben as well, you know, in terms of, you know, talking about challenges that, you know, Camila and Sydney, you know, discussed with the coronavirus, you know, with the venture capital industry in general, you know, what do you believe is the biggest challenge um, that, all the investors are facing today? 
Uh, well, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, you know, I guess there's, there's several challenges. I mean, every VC wants to find the best deals. Uh, they want to be competitive in the marketplace. Um, there's tons of competition around terms and, and, you know, um, with a particularly hot startup, um, you know, you don't want to offer something that is off market, uh, that would get you precluded from, from doing a particular deal. Um, so those are kind of more specific challenges that I think are evergreen, uh, with the marketplace. Um, you know, maybe kind of taking that previous question on the current moment, I think the biggest challenge that VCs are going to focus in, you know, the coming years is, you know, how do they, um, how do venture capitalists as, how does VC as an industry start to open the gates a little bit and start looking a little bit more like, um, you know, the communities that they, that they are among. And, you know, diversity in VC is a huge, is a huge issue. It's an incredibly homogenous space. Um, you know, there's been several studies and, and reports done over the years showing that, you know, 80% or so re, uh, of uh, investment professionals at, at venture capital funds are, are white men. So, you know, or, or, or you know, are, are white people and, and the, uh, you know, that the, this is a network business. So your fund, your portfolio companies will often look like the people that are doing the deals. So being able to, um, you know, democratize just getting into the industry, um, having less of an opaque hiring path, having a less than opaque partnership path, and um, being a little bit more transparent as to who gets access to either, you know, just joining the, joining the industry, being one of these one of these investment professionals, I think, is a huge challenge and is going to be something that needs to be taken on, you know, very deliberately. You know, we've all seen all of the, you know, funds and companies over the past couple of weeks, you know, put forth statements about, you know, how diversity is important to them and inclusion is important to them. But I think the real challenge for the industry is to is to put their money where their mouth is and see where we are, you know, six months from now, two years from now and see how the numbers have changed. Um, I know that Deloitte and the NVCA have done, they did a study about a year ago showing the progress from 2016 to 2018. And it was real, it was real progress. Um, but, you know, the numbers are still staggering. So again, what's that next, now that everybody's talking about this, what does it really look like when, when people might be held to account a little bit more? And it's, it's, it's going to be for the better, you know, when you have a more diverse, um, you know, investment force, you're going to have a more diverse portfolio and um, and that diversity of thought, I think, can lead to to meaningful returns. I would add, a, um, I think, Ben, you're spot on. I think one thing I would add is that it's not really necessarily a challenge. It's just a worry. And again, it's going back to the portfolio company perspective. I think everything is still uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen in the next few months. Uh, there is still a overwhelming amount of information out there. Sometimes people say this is going to be a quick rebound of the economy. And some people say, well, it's going to take years to recover. Uh, we haven't seen what's going to happen or the signs. So there is just this worry about, okay, how are our portfolio companies truly going to perform? And I don't think anyone, well, I won't say that, but I, I don't think we've seen yet the signs completely just because if you are a B2C company like going to consumers, there has been a lot of stimulus packages and maybe that company hasn't truly been impacted until the stimulus check, check, checks are done. Um, or if you're a B2B company, you, it's only been three months, even though it feels like a decade ago, um, but a B2B company, it, they might not have yet to gone through the contract renewal phase. And this is when a lot of the questions um, read on whether or not that product is a nice to have versus a, a must have is going to be answered. Um, if you are nice to have, those, com those companies are going to say, hey, uh, I don't need this product right now. I'm going to, you know, I have a cut budget. And we're going to either renegotiate terms or to try to find a discount or cancel contract, period. Um, so 
there's still a lot of uncertainty in the air. And the other thing that I would think, um, thank goodness, Green Ventures are not in that situation right now. And I don't know how the, the funds that are in that situations are, are doing. But if you are a VC that is fundraising at this moment or just started fundraise, you might be in a very tough situation just because a lot of the time LPs or other, you know, institutional investors might depend on the public equities to make commitments. And it's just a tough time to make commitments because there's so much um, uncertainty out there. So th those are the two things I would add um, to what Ben said, but it, it's, we don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I, I, I totally agree. And, and, you know, we have a portfolio of, you know, like 80 companies. So that's a big challenge to go through each one of your, you know, each, you know, maintain those touch points because founders, founders have uncertainty too. And there are the folks that are, you know, might fit more closely into, you know, precursors, um, you know, uh, kind of pre everything mode where it's just, okay, we just, we just got to get through it. We got to build. And that might be, you know, a nice blanket, you know, way to treat, treat folks. And then there's other people that are wondering if they're going to make it through, you know, the end of July. So being able to provide not just financial support, but, you know, that kind of, um, you know, emotional support and, and um, you know, just being there, for, you know, offering, you know, being a sounding board, giving advice. Um, that's a major, you know, that's, I, I think, Camilla, you said it's may, it may not be that challenge, but it is the current situation that we find ourselves in um, where it's, um, you know, there's no one size fits all. We don't have all the answers. We're just try, kind of trying to get through it together. And, um, and it is challenging to, uh, to navigate uncertainty. We're, we're, we are generally the type of people that, um, you know, uncertainty is risk and risk is, um, you know, risk has to be taken into account uh, when we deploy capital. So, um, so when you add in a ton more of that uncertainty, it, it makes, it, for me personally, it gives me a little bit of heartburn, but it's, it's the, you know, it's the way that the, uh, that the game has to be played right now. So it's definitely kind of part of the daily conversation, I would say. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to lead this into one of the questions from the audience. Um, and hopefully, uh, actually, Sydney, if you want to answer this one, you know, uh, what's this environment and everything, what typically will pique your interest in a startup that you're initially introduced to? You know, has that changed in today's environment or, you know, is really the same type of philosophy when you're looking at startups? I would say... Um not much has changed. I've always, so uh, Zal mentioned my background's in the public sector. And so I spent about five years in the Bloomberg administration in New York City. And I was always, you know, the public sector is always undercapitalized, always. And yet we figure it out. And so I actually love founders who have that mentality where it's like, I'm, I'm just going to get this done. You can, you can get on the train or you don't have to get on the train, but this is going somewhere and it's going to happen. And so with your money or without your money. And those are the types of founders I'm really excited about. Ones that have a fierce commitment to their mission. Ones who are building out something that are, you know, a continuation of, of what they've been thinking of or building out for the last five, 10 years. I, I went to business school at Berkeley. And so I have an aversion to what I call business school project companies, <laughs> which are like, oh, I came up with this idea last week and it's great. And I'm just like, cool, but like, what's gonna happen next week? Because I had a lot of those ideas at business school. And the week after, I was like, you know what, actually, you know, it's really fun, sleep. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and so um, people who are extremely passionate and have proven passion for what they're building is really important to me. So it's a scrappiness, proven passion. And then the other one is the one I touched on earlier, which is the democratizing access piece. I have been um, essentially focused on wealth inequality for my entire, my entire grown-up life 
since I went to college, I went to Duke undergrad and studied wealth inequality under one of the greats, Dr. Sandy Darity. And that got me on this mission and focus that I've taken since then to essentially in, explore and participate in different types of organizations and institutions that were creating allowing for an, an ability to create wealth for people who have not been able to access that before and for me what wealth looks like is access to you know quality health care that's access to um, you know an opportunity to make make a higher salary. And so the types of companies I'm interested in are essentially creating an opportunity for other people to do something that they might not have had the opportunity to do before. And I also, another piece of how I think about wealth is time. So an, a company that is giving somebody time back, um, particularly, and I'm really only care about mass markets. I think like rich people have enough stuff. <laughs> they don't need any more stuff and they have enough VCs who will back stuff for them. And so I'm interested in investing in companies that are building for um, pretty much everyone else. And so um, those are my focus areas. It hasn't changed. I'm, I'm not, I don't actually expect it ever to change. Um, so that's, that's what I'm, I'm digging into right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Camila, I know Grand Ventures, you know, focuses a little bit on the later stage, you know, after, you know, the, the MVP and revenue generating. So I imagine the focus is a little bit different, you know, compared to, uh, you know, what Sydney is looking at initially. So um, would you want to share, you know, your thoughts on, on this question? Yeah, um, we are slightly later, not too late stage um, on the seed of Series A. Um, so you're right. The I think the the main thing for seed in series series A is like the market and the team. Is the market big enough where this company can grow and be um, good size and good exit? Um, and then the team can the team perform? Like I, I think team is is key no matter state the stage you're looking at. Um, the can the team perform? Is it can do they know this space? Are they going to be a good fit with your VC? There's that too. I think what has that hasn't changed as a, as far as being two key things we look right away when we have we're talking with entrepreneurs. I think one shift there is um, with COVID. I think experienced teams have a leverage today just because it's hard to run a company and it's hard to run the company in a good environment. It's even harder to run a company in a recession. So teams that are, have a little more experience that have built companies before that has gone through a recession in the past, definitely will get uh, an uphand when it comes to pitching at this moment, just because you know that they can face through the recession. Um, or at least um, won't be as surprised as a team that is just starting to do this for the first time and hasn't gone through a recession in the past. And I think as far as market, one of the things that we are doing is just trying to understand for the companies that we are looking today, are these companies set to succeed doing in post COVID, right? Um, obviously this is all uncertain, but we can see what industries are um, thriving or expected to continue to thrive or expected to continue to ride, ride the wave of new technology and new ways to do things, things through COVID. So that's one thing that we are looking is, is this company in an industry that we think will be successful in a market that we think is going to be successful at the moment. And there are several of them. The, we mentioned tele, telemedicine. We mentioned um, the future of work type of thing, but there's other ones like touchless payments um, or behavioral health, and it's just growing. What's growing before, it's growing even more now with COVID and all the mental issues that we all having just staying at home. So just um, the core hasn't changed. It's just a little bit of a shift on how we see these aspects of team or market um, moving forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
And, you know, on the topic of, you know, entrepreneurs pitching to investors, I wanted to ask Ben a question, you know, what types of common mistakes by entrepreneurs in their pitches um, or in their early stages of business do you typically see from the other side of the table? And how do you, I, I guess, what advice do you have for them to you know, address this? How much time you got? Um, no, <laughs> but, you know, there's, um, I think there's some easy ones that are like, you know, don't, don't send the VC a 40 page deck, you know, that's, that's, that's too long. Um, yeah, there's, um, so that's like, you know, a very simple thing, but I think it goes to the fact that venture capitalists are busy. Um, you know, we see multiple pitches a day. Um, you need to be able to succinctly explain why your product or your technology is solving a pain point for somebody, you know, saving them time, saving them money, making their life significantly better in some way. So a lot of times you get entrepreneurs who are super close to their product and they, you know, it's their baby and they want to talk about it and give you the history of the world around that product. And it's not really getting to the crux of the issue of why I would want to invest. So I would say that's important to be able to show the passion and show, you know, your connection to it. That's all great. But being able to succinctly explain in however the allotted time is 20 minutes, an hour, a cup of coffee, um, you know, uh, what is your, what is your value proposition? Who's paying for it? Um, what you need money for, who the team is. Um, those are kind of the main core tenets that I look for and tangents that are leading, you know, one way or the other off of those main things don't really get the job done. So I think, I think a, a key thing to take away is just, you know, stay focused and, um, and, you know, you know, don't get bogged down onto one issue because, you know, we VCs have a checklist of what they what they're looking for. Just like Sydney, just like Camilla, you know, at at ID Ventures, we really value the team. That's across any you know kind of stage of venture capitalist. That that doesn't change. The team is is you know for me the most important thing. The market is also really important. So being able to explain you know where your product fits within a broader market and what that addressable market is in terms of size and how you plan on getting there. And then, you know, the value proposition, what is, you know, how are you making someone's life easier? How are you saving somebody time? How are you saving somebody money? Um, I, I would say that, you know, sure, throw in the five-year projections if you want. But again, you know, at ID Ventures, we're a seed, pre-seed uh, fund. You know, uh, I, I, you know, the, the five year, you know, revenue projections and three dollars will get you a cup of coffee. You know, that's that's not really how we're valuing companies. Um, so so that's, you know, maybe not a you know, it's it's a checkbox, but maybe not, you know, something that needs to be spent a lot of time on. So th those are kind of my general thoughts on on, um, you know, missteps that I kind of see. It's really just trying to stay, you know, keep a, a tight narrative keep it focused and really put yourself in the VC shoes in terms of they have a limited amount of time. What is most important to them? Yeah, I think there is definitely a challenge, you know, for, you know, uh, unproven founders, you know, who are first time founders and, you know, who, without a specific, they may not have specific experience with founding a company. And, you know, this goes into one of the audience questions as well. You know, what, what do you, and, you know, Ben, feel free to answer this and, or Sydney here, you know, what, what can venture capitalists do to, you know, basically reduce this bias of, you know, oh, we've seen five different startups and they were all experienced entrepreneurs. So we're only going to, you know, look at experienced entrepreneurs from this point onwards. Um, you know, how, how, how do you really kind of reduce that type of bias, but still keep an open mind to the great founders that are out there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Sydney said the word scrappy. I mean, it, it's, it's not something that is, you know, really written on the page or, or even, you know, kind of on, on a company's website. It really does come across in those, in those interactions that you have. And, um, you know, in, in terms of how you eliminate the bias, I mean, I think you just kind of have to have an open mind that, you know, not every successful found, 
successful founder, successful entrepreneur is going to be someone that's done it before. Everybody starts somewhere. So you really do have to kind of be able to read people, have a little bit of an EQ, you know, mindset in terms of, is this the type of person that can get this done? Do they show the passion for this, the passion and the aptitude for this particular product or this particular service to, you know, to, 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 to scale, to scale it, you know, to an acceptable level. So, you know, there, there's, I, it's it's kind of hard. It's like you, you, it's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. Scrappy is a really good word to 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 use when you're looking for you know kind of first time founders that are that are out there. You know, do they have a good energy? Do they are they passionate about this? Does that show? And and um, you know some you know not all deals get done within you know a month or two of you know meeting an entrepreneur. So if if, or so if, you know, the VC isn't like, well, we're going to start diligence full, you know, full on, you know, tomorrow, send me your data room, you know, are they responding? Are they showing you those KPIs that you, that you mentioned in, in your conversation? Are they following up? Are they, you know, doing their part to make sure that they stay in front of you? I think that that kind of all goes into it in terms of how we would, man, you know, how we would um, value a, a management team, especially a new management team. Yeah, one thing I would add, um, and I completely agree with Ben, and I just wanted to be clear, the one, when I say like experienced founders has a, a, a little bit of an advantage at this current situation because of the recession, that doesn't mean that first-time founders doesn't get fine. The majority of our portfolio companies are from first-time founders, are, com- are people that have not run a company before. Yes, they might have held whole roles um, here and there or led a team here or something, but we have the majority of our portfolio companies are first-time founders. And to, I think I agree with everything that Ben said. It's, it's more about what is the, your skills? Um, can you show the VCs that you are capable of doing this? You're coachable, right? Like, yeah, a lot of the seed investments, um, it's a battle. Like, you, you're learning. Everyone's learning. We don't know yet what's going to be the product market fit. We're all figuring this out together. But is this a stubborn founder that just don't want to listen and sometimes the experienced ones are the stubborn ones um sometimes the first time founders are actually the ones that are like hey i just want advice i just want help and i want the vc the right vc that's going to help me navigate through the next phase of my company and those founders are very typically they succeed because they their ears are open they're listening they're doing their best, they're reaching out to advisors and they're doing everything they can to like make the right and best decision. So it's totally fine if you are a first time, first time founder, there's no problem with that at all. It's more about your attitude, your scrapness, your um, coachability and and then you know your product and your market and how the, if it's a good idea we get, and you can show that you can execute it's done. That's, that's kind of the story. Yeah. Co- coachability is, is huge. I, I would, I just want to agree with Camilla. Coachability is huge. I mean, yeah, how, how do you respond to, you know, constructive feedback? How do you respond to a no from another investor? Are, are you, are you taking that in stride, folding it into your pitch, folding it into your business plan? So yeah, just, Sydney, go for it. I just wanted to, 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 you know, jump in on that one. Mm-hmm. I think so much of it is, um, I think those are all good points. Um, I think, though, that the venture capital community also needs to do a good hard look at their own issues. (laughs) I don't think it's always like, oh, the founder just needs to listen to me. I think actually it's like the VCs need to review what are the structural problems that have created such an equity within their own portfolio companies, within their own portfolio. Like, why? Why? Do you only have white guys in your portfolio or why do you only have like, like maybe you have some black people, but they have not reached series B or series C. Why? I think there's a lot of whys that need to be answered internally. And I think a lot of the, the, the blame is on the BC community. I don't think it's on founders. And so I think that what we try to do is essentially get a portfolio that mirrors actually the the population of the United States. And so if there are 13, 15% of 
people who identify as Black in the United States, we, ha we want to have 13 to 15% of our portfolio that identifies as Black. If there's 50% of the United States that identifies as women, we want 50% of, of our portfolio to identify as women. And I think that's how you change things. You have to have goals, you have to have metrics, you have to have accountability to yourselves. Um, it's not just a founder issue. And Sydney, you know, what, what strategy can the venture capital community do to support you know, founders of color? Maybe on, is it, you know, is it providing the resources, giving people a chance? Or, you know, would it be, you know, in addition to, you know, I guess, structural change, you know, what do you see that the venture capital community can do? I think there is like, one thing that I've been really reflecting on in the past couple of weeks, because it's been absolutely horrific and traumatic these last couple of weeks, and I'm exhausted. Um, but I think the main thing that I've been reflecting on is like everything we do in life is, is a choice. It's like we are all agents of our own lives. And I think there's a lot of uh, decisions that happen kind of like haphazardly, like, oh, I'm going to, I might live, who knows, maybe, let's say I live in Noe Valley, which is like the fanciest place to live in San Francisco. And like uh, a lot of VCs live there. And I'm going to decide that I actually want to spend my night getting dinner with my neighbor, who's also a VC, who tends, who happens to be a white guy, who is, um, you know, really, really well off. And what I could have done, uh, in that night is I, I could have, you know, done an office hours for black founders. I could have um, done some research on my own to find organizations that are supporting black and brown founders. And I think, I think what there hasn't been enough of is like actually um, just like reflection <laughs> as like easy as that sounds um, like what steps are you taking and actually you know, like purposefully not taking to make yourselves more available and accessible to, to people of color. Like, what does your circle look like? Why does it look like that? How are you, how are you changing it? Because I think so much of it is, is we are, we are empowered to do this. It, it's not rocket science. You just have, you just have to make really thoughtful changes. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think there's, there has been slight improvements, a little bit of the gender situation, very slight improvements, but there's so much to be done. Um, and not even speaking about people of color or, you know, Latinas or anything. Um, so there's a lot of work. And I think I agree with all your points, Sydney. I think one thing I would, I think office hours, I think you proactively reaching out to funds and accelerators that are dedicated to, that type, you know, really serving that minority group. It's something um, interesting to do and partner with them. There's tons of them out there. Um, but we, we tend to be get really comfortable and not get out of our comfort zone. And we tend to just rely on the warm introductions of the VC community. And I think that's a, a huge mistake. I think we need to um, learn how to lead by example. I think I'm really one thing that we're really proud at Grand Ventures is that Literally, we respond to pretty much every single email, um, you know, or every LinkedIn reached out. Um, and if it's, we do our best at least. And we, I think it should be like that. And leading by example to, from a team perspective, we are a team of four. And we are extremely diverse. It's 50-50 women and men. Uh, we are diverse from culture. I'm from Brazil. There are people from different backgrounds and different um, culture backgrounds. So I think when you do that internally on your own firm, you really realize that naturally that unconscious bias fades away a little bit and you start having pipeline from other groups from all over. We have 12 portfolio companies. Five of them, it's not by any means ideal yet, but five of them are from um, diverse CEOs, either women or people from other country. So I think, and I think it's, we didn't necessarily do anything intentional 
or you know try to go above and you know to say like oh this founder is a diversity let's invest on them no it was just naturally just by building a team that is diverse so i think it starts in our own firms and as vcs if they can start thinking that way we will all see that naturally we will see a pipeline of diverse founders coming in very um easily Yeah, and, and you know, th thank you, for, thank you for sharing that. And you know, one of the things I think this um, wanted to uh, ask a question from the audience here as well. Um, you know, this this goes to almost when we think about founders in the Midwest and Michigan. Um, you know, Michigan is is a small market for raising money. And you know, I know Sydney, you're on the West Coast, but you're looking at founders nationally. You know, how many? I guess the question from the audience is, you know. So Ben, you know, why would anybody want to stay in the Midwest and Michigan when there's not many shots of raising money here? Uh, well, you know, ID Ventures is open for business. So there's, uh, <laughs> if you are, you know, seed or pre-seed uh, company, you know, we, we uh, were, you know, we're, we're eager to, to, to meet you. But, you know, I, I, the obvious one would be, you know, a, a lesser cost of living. Um, you know, you can build and scale a business for cheaper than you can, uh, you know, in Detroit than you can in San Francisco. So, you know, that's, that's one thing. And, and, you know, I think there's something to be said about being connected to your community, you know, uh, both Sydney and Camila made great points about, um, you know, in investing in founders that look like your firm and that look like the community you're in, you know, ID Ventures being, you know, maybe at an advantage there being, you know, domiciled in Detroit, which is the largest black city in America, you know, we have a, we are predisposed to being, you know, with, um, and we also, you know, only invest in Michigan companies. So we're kind of predisposed to having a more diverse portfolio. Um, that being said, you know, it is a, it, it, it is a deliberate choice for us to make sure that that, in, that portfolio looks that way. I think we just ran the numbers and uh, in 2017, I think our you know, deals up to 2017, we were about 23, 24% of uh, you know, black Latinx um, and women uh, founders. And you know, in the deals since then, we are now at 44%. So that, that, is, a, that is a deliberate choice for us to say, you know, we, want our port, you know, we want our portfolio to uh, you know, to be as diverse as, as the community in which that we're in. So we're, you know, it's, we're making those strides. And, you know, we, we think that Detroit has a great story to tell. Michigan has a great story to tell. This is a great business friendly community to be in and it's a great place to start a business. Um, so I, I, you don't, you don't need to look to move to this, you know, to the coast to be successful. You know, there's plenty of large enterprises that for, for B2B companies, um, and, you know, there's, you know, interesting emerging tech coming out of, um, you know, coming out of places like Grand Rapids in Detroit. So I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's more of a, it's becoming more of a misnomer um, to think that you, um, you know, have to either go to the coast for your funding or go to the coast to actually uh, start your business. It, it might actually behoove you to stay put. Um, and that's, that's not just Detroit. That could be any other, you know, major metro in the Midwest or, or elsewhere. Certainly, certainly. The only thing I would add to that is I think that um, I don't know what what the ecosystem is. I don't know the ecosystem too deeply in Detroit. And so that's my own um, like naivete. I do think though in other ecosystems in the Midwest that um, there isn't yet a very mature like group of VCs there's usually like a group of angel investors who made their money off of real estate or, you know, private equity or something like that. And so they don't always know what fair terms look like. And I do think that sometimes it is helpful for founders to at least just shop around. I was talking to this founder who's building in Houston the other day and his like pre-money valuation was like $1.5 million. And, I, and he was raising like $200,000. And I was like, bad, bad, don't do that. <laughs> but like, that's what the investors in Houston, you know, that's the term sheet that he got from investors in Houston. 
And I think that there is um, an importance to know what, what companies are getting in the Valley, because I think that it helps you understand, um, is this deal fair? Is this, uh, why, why, why might this person be giving me this really low balled offer? Um, what actually, what actually could I build? I do think it gives you a lot of perspective when you see some of these ideas coming out of different places um, that you might not have access to if you're if you're too focused on um, you know building within a really really tiny place. Not the, and I, Detroit's huge, so I'm not saying Detroit is, is small, but I think that um, you know just having that aperture of understanding of what what is um, going on in startups across the country is really valuable from a competitive advantage standpoint. Yeah, and I think that's for both um, VCs and startups, right? Like the same way that startups need to know what um, VCs are in the coast and what they would be valuing that company at and that kind of stuff. I think VCs that are in the Midwest also need to be seeing what's happening in the coast because a lot happens there. And sometimes we think if we see a company here, we think, oh, this is great. But then when you go see the competitive landscape, there's already two or three or four or five, whatever, in the coast that has deep pockets with large VCs and could dominate one of these companies in two seconds because they can raise money really fast in the, in the coast. I wouldn't say, <clears throat> I will defend any of the, the VCs in the Midwest because I think um, in the past, yes, there were a lot of, um, I would say, you know, the, just deep in, I don't know, VCs that were um, as mature as the, as the coast. But I think that's not the case anymore. We have tons of VCs that are raising like, you know, Arboretum here in, um, in, um, in Michigan they they're very well known the whole country about their healthcare space and they are in their third fund um we, we have tons of vcs in their third or fourth funds in chicago there have have raised hundreds of millions of dollars um indiana as well with indianapolis so there's tons of vcs that are big yes it's just not as much as you will see in the west or east coast in they don't have as deep of a pocket yet as those firms have, which that's part of the reason that things are so priced, so highly priced in the East and West Coast, not only the, the cost of living, but you have way too many VCs there trying to, de to deploy capital and then it becomes competitive and they have hundreds of millions of dollars in their funds. So they don't care if they're paying a little bit overpriced. So it's kind of like a mix. You do, as a startup, you do need to understand a little bit there and a little bit here and kind of find a way of, all right, well, raising there is going to give you a, a higher valuation, yes, but they also want to raise in a higher, um, in a bigger round and take a bigger ownership and things like that. Here, typically, you have a much lower need for capital because your operating costs are much lower, so you don't need to raise a $10 million round in your first round or five even you need to raise one or 1. 1.5. Um, so that's too, too little for a big VC in the, in California. And they're like, ah, well, one and a half, it's my first check. So um, that's why there's actually a good balance and you can find those good VCs in the Midwest for that first round. Good, good VCs are well connected. And then those VCs will help you make the connections to the coast when you're ready for your series A or series B, for example, and you're raising, you know, five to $10 million. Thank you, Camila. And so I want to be respectful of time and really save the last 10 minutes uh, to, you know, answer the audience's questions. And so, you know, right now, if you have questions, please put it into the question and answer box. Um, and then I'll just go down the list and, you know, ask our panelists some of the questions that you've been asking. Um, you know, I just wanted to start off with, um, I think asking Camille this question, you know, with the 12 companies in the portfolio, has there been a You froze on us, Sal. <laughs> he is gone. Let's see if I can- The general trend, I, I, and, you know, how port times and- oh. 
Zhao, you froze for a second. Can you repeat that? I just heard it. <laughs> am, I ba- am I back? Sorry. Yes, you're back. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, Camila, you know, um, has there been a general trend in how portfolio companies have adapted and responded to the current times? Or have you seen that each company responds in its own way? And this is from Vlad. Yeah. Hmm. I think, I mean, every company is different um, and they're in a different situation. I think all of them has revealed their plan for 2020, at least our portfolio companies. And um, they were more conservative on some of the projects that they were going to do. So if there were like five initiatives that they were trying to tackle in 2020, maybe they put two of them on pause um, or they went in a hiring freeze they were going to hire a few executives and they said, you know what, let's continue to operate with the number of people we have just to find ways to conserve cash a little bit. So just prioritizing projects and focusing on last of the last projects, trying to keep the hiring free. Thank goodness we didn't, didn't have any portfolio company that actually had to fire, you know, let go of employees. Um, yeah, it's just revising their, even though they're all different, I think the common path was really revising the 2020 plan to better prioritize and what really matters. And, um, you know, more of a like hiring freeze or any other type of um, cash contingency. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to move to the next question, you know, and Ben, I think you should answer this one. So, this is from Lexi Money uh, Munley, who says, I'm a rising uh, senior business student at U of M, interning in banking this summer, um, and interested in entrepreneurship and venture. You know, what advice do you have for young professionals like me who would like to forge meaningful collect- connections to not only get into the industry, but find success in it? Uh, well, <laughs> so I, I did banking for five years, so it took me quite a while actually to, uh, to forge those meaningful connections and then find my place in, in the venture community. Um, but that was also 12 years ago, so I'm sure things have changed. Um, I guess I would say that, you know, get the most out of the, um, out of your banking experience. Uh, it is, it can set the foundation for, you know, a solid, um, you know, skill set when it comes to, um, you know, financial analysis and, and also just hard work, uh, which, you know, is, is transferable across anything. Um, try to find those industries within whatever you're doing at your banking internship that are potentially tech enabled and look for other kinds of capital, not just, you know, from a bulge bracket investment bank or, or from, um, you know, uh, a more mature, uh, you know, um, capital market and, um, you know, uh, just do your best to network and find, um, you know, uh, find ways in from, you know, from the folks that are, that are around you. I mean, everyone, um, you know, in, in my experience, you know, th- that probably wasn't a focus at the time, just given that things were a little bit more siloed, bankers did their thing and VCs did, uh, did theirs. But I think as more, as more tech companies have matured and have access to public markets, there's a little bit more of, um, uh, of an overlap there and, and, and more networking going on. So the opportunities there are probably a little bit bigger than they were when I was there, but um, definitely just, you know, get the most you can out of the experience. If that's not what you truly want to do going forward, then, you know, find, find a way and find, um, you, know, uh, you know, like I said, find those key learnings um, and, and make the best of it. Yeah, thank you for that advice, Ben. And um, the next question from the audience, uh, from Angela Williams, um, w- wanted to ask you here, uh, Sydney. So, you know, Angela's looking for a directory of VCs that do s- specifically support founders of color. You know, where do you suggest uh, her uh, to look um, and really um, find these opportunities? Yeah, so I actually helped create this list. So there are two. Um, there's one that I created last year called the Interrupters List, which is essentially a list of VC firms who have invested in at least two Black and or Latinx founders in the last, I think, two years. And you can ser- you can find that on Medium. Just search the Interrupters List, Precursor Ventures. And then People of Color in Tech created a list, which is also really great, of 
all of the VC firms who have invested in at least one black founder. And so you can find that um, by searching POCIT a medium. Um, and I think it's a Google doc where you can just like download it and play around with it and, and explore. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and then a, uh, another question here. Um, so this is a, for a specific company from Tracy. Her, her company is called Kids Explore Japan. And um, Sydney, I'll, I'll feel free to answer this as well. You know, my company, Global Kids Explore, in Detroit offers uh, Japanese language and culture to students, businesses, and other organizations interested in cultural exposure. What type of VCs uh, you know, should I approach when looking for potential investors? I think that's a pretty broad company. Like, I don't think that you need to limit your exposure to certain VCs. I would say the one thing that we focus on, though, at Precursor is, um, I think to Ben and Camilla said something to this point, too, where it's like, when you're raising a certain amount of money, you need to find VCs who are actually interested in deploying that amount of money. And so if you're raising $200,000, don't go to benchmark. <laughs> they want to give you like $10 million. If you're raising, um, you know, $10 million, don't come to us. We want to invest, you know, $250,000 into companies. And so I think um, NFX, there's a website called signal.nfx.com that I think actually has a really great um, directory of investors and their average check sizes, because I think that's something that's really hard to find on investors' websites. And um, I don't know why, but it is. And so I think that that's a good resource that I usually point founders to. Yeah, and I would add um, not only check sizes, but um, the different strategies, right? So there are stages I, I didn't see, I don't know what stage of your company your end is this you know do you already have a product you know to your point maybe sin is fun is ideal if you're still building a product right now or do you have a product and you're kind of doing pilots maybe it's a pre-seed investment or if you already have some sales it becomes a seed so it's just like what stage are you in and look for companies that invest in that stage because they are going to be people who can add value as you grow through that phase or even the business model. Like there are companies that are not, that doesn't invest in healthcare. There are companies that doesn't invest in, you know, um, education. So just finding the stage, the check size, um, the industry or the business model. Some companies don't go, don't like consumer. Um, it's not their specialty, so they, they want to be a little more focused, and they do B2B. Um, so just trying to find this, is, I know it's hard, um, but I think once you speak with one or two, you can start asking them, like, what are other firms that invest in this space or in this type of business model, and then go from there. Yeah, that's great advice. And this, you know, Camille, I want to lead this into another question as well. Um, and this is um, slightly different. So as a question from someone that's anonymous, you know, in regards to growth capital in the Midwest, it seems like many exponentially growing startups rarely receive or lack growth equity options in the Midwest. Um, so do you guys see this? Do you see this void uh, being filled sometime soon or has it been filled already? Yeah, so here's what happens, I think. Uh, and I would try to explain, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's just the, how we, it is, but it's just that, as we were saying a little earlier, um, the venture capital community is not as mature as it is in the East and West Coast, right? There, you have funds that have raised millions, um, hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars. In the Midwest, you have funds that are much smaller. So take, for example, us at Grand Ventures. We closed our first fund last year at $28 million. This, is, this was voted the, um, voted, no, it was, um, it was the, the, the largest debut fund for Michigan. So as a first fund, it was the largest that Michigan ever had. Obviously, if you go to Chicago, you have funds that are much higher, um, you know, raising $200 million or whatever it is. That's still small for some 
for in comparison to some um, VCs in the East and West Coast. When you're talking about growth capital, these companies sometimes are raising 10, 15, more, it's a lot more money in capital um, at a way higher valuation. So for us that are, it's a smaller fund, for us to have a meaningful ownership on that company, we would have to write a huge check. So we wouldn't be able to write, for example, a initial $5 million check because that would be one fifth of our fund pretty much. So that's where it becomes a little complicated for funds that are a little, a little smaller um, in the Midwest because the funds are not big enough where they can just um, write huge checks and still have enough exposure to companies to diversify their portfolio. So that's why we kind of have to, we, we limit ourselves, for example, at Grand Ventures, um, our initial checks are between 500K and $1 million, which is actually pretty sizable for the, the Midwest. Um, and then we do follow ons later, but the, where when you go to the West Coast, you, their funds are so big, they can write a $5 million check, $5 million check easy, a $10 million check easy. Um, so yeah, we're not quite there yet, just because the majority of the funds are not super large. And if we were to write a check in a growth um, equity company, it will take pretty much the whole fund. So um, hopefully that we'll get there soon. And I think it will. I think we'll see more and more of a trend of the West Coast or East Coast being very saturated and companies in VCs realizing that we, we need to grow more into the middle of the country in other regions. Yeah, thank you for the sort of thorough answer. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask probably one or two more questions. And then I'm um, sorry, everyone that we couldn't get to your questions, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, so the last two questions I'll ask is uh, from Siobhan Henderson uh, for Ben, you know, what would you say a pre revenue company and founder needs to have prepared before exploring a VC investment to demonstrate that they have done their due diligence? Uh, ben, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so a pre-revenue company, you know, before talking to a VC, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, just because you haven't sold your product doesn't mean that you haven't, you know, that, that you're precluded from, you know, raising capital. So I, obviously, you know, having an MVP um, that, you know, could potentially have been tested in the market through a, pre, a free pilot, I guess it depends on the, on the type of company. If you're a B2C, and you have a bunch of free users and you're building a community and it's um, you're, you're kind of exhibiting those ex that organic growth um, from, from, you know, the marketplace, you're on the app store or something to that effect. Um, you know, that's uh, you know, that shows meaningful growth and potential, you know, opportunity for revenue down the line. If you are a more enterprise company and, and doing during, you know, B2B um, and you have a product, you've built out a team, uh, and you just need capital to, uh, you know, hire a sales force or to fund a particular paid pilot, you know, the, you know, that, that's, um, you know, that, that, that's, those are, uh, again, meaningful metrics that, uh, by which that we can kind of evaluate. At ID Ventures, what we like to do is kind of fund milestones. So if you're going to meet with us, you really, you know, what we would like to, you know, kind of focus the diligence process on, and it starts with the pitch, is, you know, what is our money going to fund? Is it going to fund a, you know, build out of the product uh, at which, you know, um, you know, at a later date will show significant value, you know, uh, for another round of financing? Or um, are you going to hire a, you know, key salesperson that is going to bring in X amount of contracts that again, at, you know, at a, at a certain amount of, uh, at a, after a certain amount of time, we'll, we'll have it, you know, reach the company to another valuation inflection point. So just being very clear about what the use of funds is, even if you aren't, if you're not making revenue, you can still, you know, obviously raise capital. Now, last question I'll address to Cindy here. And uh, from Eileen Weathers, she wants to thank all the panelists for sharing the great insta uh, insights, statistics, still reflect a stark contrast among VCs in terms of diversity. You know, from your perspective, what recommendations might you suggest to prepare the next generations of VC 
i.e. curriculum, advocacy, allyship, to address the issue which directly impacts, uh, impacts on business? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think one of the best books on this, and I'm reading it now, it's called How to Be Anti-Racist and uh, by Dr. Kendi. And he is essentially detailing how race, being racist is like, it's actually like, most people are never like constantly, like in every single action racist. And race, and the fact that we have like used this as like some pejorative term to like, you know, qualify a whole host of the population is actually renders it quite useless. And what we should instead do is dissect how institutions are actually creating racist policies. And he defines any policy as being racist as it, it creates a certain population of people that doesn't reflect the greater population. So he's saying like, I mean, VC, I'd say is a racist structure. Most of the structures within VC are racist. And I think he would agree with that because its outcomes are so, like the, the numbers are just silly. I don't even know them, they're so small. <laughs> of the number of like black women who are funded, the number of black women who are VCs, the number of black men who are VCs, it's like just crazy. And so I think that, um, I, think, I think one of the things that has really helped me is just like understanding the, getting the language to be able to have conversations with people um, on this topic has been immensely valuable. And I think it's sad that, you know, I'm, I'm in a book club and we're discussing how to be anti-racist. And one of the things that we talked about was just kind of like, it's kind of sad that, you know, this wasn't just like required reading in like fifth grade, you know, like this is something that I should have been taught. This is something that I think should be like, like woven into the discourse because like, the country was founded on a lot of racist institutions. And so for us not to be able to talk about that then keeps us kind of, you know, behind. And so um, that's one of the things I've been doing. I'm not a teacher and so I don't, I can't like put together a whole curriculum, but I do think there's just like a lot of, a lot of learning that all of us need, need to do um, just by living in the United States of America. And with that, um, you know, wanted to thank all of the panelists uh, for your time today. Um, really, really great answers to a lot of the questions. I also wanted to thank the audience for, for a lot of the insightful questions um, that we asked the panelists at the end. Um, as Piper said, uh, there will be a recording of the session. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but, you know, feel free to, um, you know, let, um, uh, let us know, uh, you know, how you know we can help moving forward. Um, I'm sure the panelists can provide their emails or any other contact information, um, and they should be on the Detroit Startup Week website. So please check check that out. But um, otherwise, you know, thank. I want to thank everybody and really um, uh, hope everybody stays safe and you know stays well in the in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you. It's great being here. Thank you, Joe.